Public Works Committee meeting. Um, as usual, we have uh, a general agenda and a consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda items are typically taken on one motion unless something <coughs> needs to be removed for approval. We got a fairly short uh, agenda on both uh, counts this evening. Uh, do we need to pull either of the consent items for discussion? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, if uh, you'll vote yes uh, or no uh, on approving the consent agenda. And that's approved. Uh, we have four items on the uh, uh, general agenda. I uh, have a, a, a resolution regarding road closures associated with uh, special events, parades, and races on routes affected by the Business 40 closure. And I'll note that you have in your packets, uh, on, you should have loaded, um, a uh, revised alternative as well. Um, G2 is consideration of a resolution authorizing a sign for the innovation quarter. Um, G3 is a hobby park master plan presentation. And G4 uh, is a report on recycling commodities pricing and city revenues. Uh, let's take item number G1, please. Okay. And as noted, the uh, original form of the resolution was a moratorium. The revised alternative that's in your packet um, uh, is a little more flexible than that. Uh, Mr. Turner, would you report on that item, please? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Based upon feedback that staff got regarding this item when we brought it to you last time, we retooled this item to be a resolution expressing the City Council's intent regarding special events during the closure of Business 40 and we explain sort of the background on that and then the resolution and we also say that the uh, council therefore be it resolved that the mayor and city council of winston-salem does hereby direct the city manager and his staff to work with event promoters and developers to schedule both uh, the event time and route so as to mitigate the effects of the event on residential roadways and be it further resolved that well-established events whose impacts are well known and um, traditional will be allowed to continue to use their normal routes. This is in response to the feedback that we got that uh, a moratorium, initially we were proposing six months or even a moratorium of three months, would be onerous on the events that had been planned and had already moved fairly far along in their process and that we still wanted to make sure that we were considering the impacts on of those events and other events that are planned on residential streets and try to deal with not having those streets get unnecessarily burdened with the additional traffic from both the closure of Business 40 and the closures associated with the event. Be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. As I understand, uh, this would give you the flexibility to particularly address um, uh, what has been in some years a proliferate proliferation of events using the, the same routes uh, for a lot of new uh, activities that uh, was creating a burden on some neighborhoods. That is correct. And we would also be working with our marketing and communications department and our city DOT, of course, to implement routes that would uh, work well for the event promoters. But we have the option now of additional greenway options that had not been in place in years past, and so we would be encouraging to look at encouraging promoters of new events to look at those routes of course uh, other questions for mr turner yes the we're still looking at a november closing of 40 at this point yes it's november 1st november 30th do we know we don't know, we don't know yet as nc consult i'm uh, sorry contracting team has been working the project the date shifts a little bit so right. we really don't know uh, i wouldn't be comfortable giving you a number or a date more specific right. Than that the, 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 right the problem that I'm seeing is that uh, with that kind of closure we are not going to know exactly what the traffic patterns or impacts are going to be uh, in December for example or even late November depending on when this happens which is of course not only the holiday season which when everybody's going crazy anyway and on, on the streets uh, but also then you, th you layer in these races and these walks on that. 
um, I, I'm comfortable, not, I mean, it's maybe not the word, to uh, allow staff, city manager, to act as the arbitrator in all of this. But I see uh, a big problem for you guys uh, with the demands of these social causes that these races represent, all being worthy and needy and traditional, and trying to then uh, control those, I think is going to be a challenge for you guys. And I guess I, I'm just issuing a warning, as it were, that if we go down this road, that um, if you need to come back to council for some reason with this, I think we should revisit it because I think it's a little early to tell what all the impacts are going to be and particularly when they're talking about the time of year they're closing this down going to be congested anyway. Uh, I'm just a little concerned about just throwing this back to you guys. Mr. Larson's ward and my ward are the two probably most heavily impacted by the fund runs. <clears throat> Old Salem catches an awful lot of them. <clears throat> Running Mead Park is everybody's favorite place to run through. Over the last couple of years, staff has done a very good job. Tabitha Bailey, I think, has done a really great job of, of deflecting a lot of those down to um, Innovation Quarter, where they've been a big hit. I mean, people really enjoy doing that. So it's taken a lot of that burden off. The one really big one that is a concern from sort of both sides is sort of the, the, the movable object and the irresistible force is the, uh, what's the name of it? Mistletoe Run. The Mistletoe Run, which is, it's a big event, and it's and every year I get a lot of noise from, a lot of concern from the neighborhoods about the impact of that, um, and yet it's a time-honored tradition. We are going to, we're going to have some opportunity to sort of gauge what will happen as far as traffic diversion, and we had one this past weekend uh, where 40 was shut down, the, the area that will impact this particular event um, was shut down this past weekend. So we're We've got some opportunities to learn from that and to, and to think about uh, routes, but we really need to pay attention. We really need to do some planning because it, that could be that could be a, just a, an absolute firebomb um, that goes wrong. So I've got a lot of concern. I'd really like staff to look at, and I don't know if there's a a post mortem after this weekend where traffic traffic and the police department get together and say, okay, what really happened? What was the time of day? It, it was bad, but it's going to take some planning to keep it from being. Um, an additional impact, an additional layer over what it usually is every year. So I urge uh, that we get our act together on it. Yeah. And I had um, uh, had recognized that that was probably the largest event during that uh, proposed time period, and therefore it has um, uh, a, a possibly a unique level of impact, certainly on the on the neighborhoods that it's run through. Um, although the original uh, resolution proposal exempted the holiday parade that same uh, eve well the evening of the same day as well as the Martin Luther King Day uh, parade so um, uh, I, I thought it was reasonable to inquire further into uh, what impacts it would have on the uh, on the, the sponsoring institution and on the projects that they fund with those proceeds um, I, I contacted um, the uh, the Y yesterday to see if they had been aware of the prospect, and they were not. Um, I invited them to come and, and bring a little background information on on what that event is and what it does in their planning. I know that we've got a, a two gentlemen from uh, the Y. Uh, do you have that uh, sort of that summary information uh, with you? Okay, would, would you come forward perhaps and, and introduce yourself, name and, and address for the record and um, uh, give us a little background on the event? I think this would be, this is the 35th uh, annual. Uh, uh, right. That's correct. Uh, my name is Daryl Head. I live at 4031 Ivy Bluff Trail in Winston-Salem. And hey, Joe Peel, I'm, I'm the executive director of the William G. White Junior YMCA, 3605 F High Meadows Drive, Winston-Salem. And I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the YMCA of Northwest North Carolina. Thank you for coming. Yep. Thank you for having us, Council Members. Um, the Mistletoe Race, is a we've been doing this for 35 years. It is a large uh, fundraiser for our efforts to fight childhood obesity and ch our childhood programs. Uh, we raised, last year we raised $70,000, and we've been doing that pretty consistently. That's net that we put back into uh, our child uh, health programs for our area. It's We typically have 
between 3,000 and 4,000 runners. 4,000 has been our high point. We do three races that day, a one-mile fun run, a uh, 5K, and a half marathon. The, uh, it is a, if you've been there, um, probably three, you know, a third to half the participants are children. So this is a, and teens, this is a day where the family is involved and they're out doing something healthy in our community. We do draw from around the area. We had people from 27 states last year, and we had, um, um, let's see, that's, that's about 400 runners, runners, and they bring their families with them to come into town to do this event. They're also staying at our hotels and eating at our restaurants as well. Um, it's, a, it's been a great event. I brought you a, a letter from our CEO, Stan Law, and then also our impact report from the last two years of the race as well. Not a whole lot more to add, but registration for this year started on June 1st, and we already have over 200 people registered so far, which is way ahead of pace. Um, we're not really sure why, but we're excited about that. We, we are doing a rebrand because of our 35th, so we think some of the marketing and some of the information out there hopefully has got some people excited about it. So registration begins June 1st for this year. And I will say, it's a, the, the historic nature of, the, of this run being 35 years and the, the, the route that we do run, which is up through Buena Vista and through um, uh, Grayland and uh, the Renola House and Wake Forest, is a very attractive uh, implement, uh, a, a very attractive part of this run. Uh, and we have a lot of people that, that rate the course very high. It's also a, a certified course, so people can use this course, the half marathon course, to qualify for other events, and they do come in town to qualify for other events. I think we're the largest certified race in, in the triad. Uh, wouldn't surprise me. <clears throat> and I, I know Mr. McIntosh is expressing concerns on, on behalf of his constituents in the, in the center city that, that we keep a special eye on traffic and parking impacts this year yes, um, because of the potential for there to be extra traffic on Northwest and, Ren and Renola in particular, I think. Um, we, sorry, we, we have worked with uh, the neighbors before in the past and um, worked on getting um, institutions around the area, churches, businesses that allow us to have parking. We've actually bused people in for parking to try to get parking off the streets and out of the park. And we had one, one many years ago, there was a problem with people parking in the park and we We've ended that and, and really tried to uh, use all of our connections in the community to use true parking lots at, at surrounding institutions and, and direct people to those and, and mitigate the parking in the neighborhood and in um, and the park area. Yeah. I, I don't know, um, uh, Ms. McCullough, I don't know if Wista has um, uh, buses for hire, but I know Park does. Um, uh, okay, well, for, but for, a, for shuttle op additional shuttle opportunities perhaps from a more remote park and ride uh, lot um, that might be um, of, uh, of interest to to the Y in terms of Clemens time. YMCA, you know some of the yeah. outer outer Ys. Sure. Hmm. But it, yeah. no, no, sir. Uh, we do not have any buses. For, I didn't think so, but I, yeah, I didn't want commercial wanna, purposes. I didn't want to pitch the other uh, our our other cooperating transit agency <laughs> and, and neglect to. We, we run a fleet of buses with the YMCA busing kids around, so we do have buses. It would be nice to have places to, to bus from and really work with the, with the city to identify places where we could bring people and then bus them in. Um, we, we appreciate the change in the, in the item today and, the open, and that it's open to discussion on this because it's a, an important race for the YMCA and our service to youth, and it's also, I think, a great community event. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Any other, other questions? Thank you. No, nothing just yeah. on. I don't think there's any question about the value of the event and the services provided by the Y and to be commended for it. And, and I think the, the biggest problem, the fear, is the uncertainty of what is going to happen this fall. And, and I would suggest that perhaps, um, you know, certainly working with the neighborhoods, but somehow there's going to have to be communication between these events and the traffic control aspects of this city, which is DOT or, or within our, our management system. And I don't know whether the, whether the DOT, in co coordination with the state, has redlined certain corridors that are going to be obviously impacted and making that information available to these race preparers because you kind of need to know if Renolda Road is going to be a very busy road that day, yes, uh, you need to know that and we need to know that. So uh, some coordination needs to be made on your routes and the interface with the projected impact that closing 40 is going to have. 
And I don't hear, I don't quite hear how that um, interface is being made right now. And I think we're throwing it back on staff, the way we're talking about it right now, to somehow communicate uh, your routes and have that married then with the projections of traffic impact based on the day, based on the time of day, and, and what, you know, what we're likely to be expecting during particularly December, um, November and December. Though you can get into January, February, everything slows down. So I would encourage, and I'm asking the city manager this largely, you know, as a mechanism to identify hot spots within the city that we anticipate that if you can avoid them, then everybody's going to be happier with yep. that. And we've got to provide that information to you, and you've got to provide some coordination with us to allow that race. And it may mean that this year or the next year, you're going to have to modify your route just a little bit to accommodate uh, our needs as a city to transport people in the neighborhoods and whatever. Doesn't mean we don't want to support the event. We absolutely do. But I'm asking, I guess, a little bit of flexibility as you look at your route. You say you've done it every year for the last 30 years. Uh, you know, I got that. I understand that tradition. But also, you have to understand what we're going to be dealing with for the next two years. Yes, sir. And we, we learned about this last night. Thank you. And we just met back here. And Great. I, if you permit us to have some meetings with transportation, I would, would love to. Highly encourage it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. And I'm familiar with the route from having volunteered at, at the event uh, and run it a few times. Uh, and the, the main intersection that I can immediately think of that I would expect uh, would want to be sure is kept as clear as possible is Northwest and Renolda so that you will be having uh, traffic coming down Renolda and turning into town. Uh, but as I recall from the rest of the, of the route, that should be doable. Um, you know, make, the, make the turn a little tighter than, than most years going out and back. We, we exchange cards, and I'm certain we'll be talking soon. <laughs> yes, yes. Who on staff will be point for event stuff going forward? Well, Mr. Turner has agreed to the <laughs> retirement. And <laughs> special projects. The, um, Is there another Mr. Turner? Yes, right. <laughs> going to come back to special projects. Who do, I, who do I put in my speed dial and, and place a tab? Uh, Mr. Turner's going to enter the race. I think he told me he's going <laughs> to run the half marathon. You guys are on <laughs> The... Uh, uh, it'll be it'll be DOT along with um, uh, Mr. Mr. Raleigh's office. We tra we're transitioning transitioning permitting for special events back to Ken Millett in that in that group. So yeah, I just want to make sure when these conversations are occurring, we have folks from the neighborhoods or at the table. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Any thank other? You. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, Thanks, if, if you can hang with us just a second, you know, you can sit down, but just in case some other question comes up. Um, Um, any further discussion on, on the proposed resolution? Uh, if not, is there a motion? So moved. I'll second. And you'll vote on that. Very good. All right. Thank you. And we will keep, uh, Mr. McIntosh, Mr. Larson, we will keep uh, close eye on not just this event but other events in the area and I think this is probably a, a year that we can say that this is not the best year to propose a new event um, blocking streets in, no, I agree. in in this area so thank you very much gentlemen thank, thank you, you. Uh, item G2 please Item G2, consideration of a resolution authorizing a sign for Wake Forest Innovation Quarter near the intersection of Martin Luther King Jr. Drive and Research Parkway. All right. Um, Mr. Turner. Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, there is a provision in the UDO that would allow for signs that otherwise wouldn't be allowed but are important from a regional, from a city council standpoint to be installed at the direction of the council. Uh, there is a request from the WFIQ to install a sign. I think you've got some pictures in your package, so if you take a look at those, you'll see where it's proposed at the intersection of Research Parkway and Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. It would be on private property. Uh, they are proposing to put it on a trellis system similar to what you have already in the Rails with Trails project on the southern end. Uh, and so staff has reviewed it and feel that this is an appropriate uh, option for council to recommend as a exemption to the UDO. 
Uh, we have done this before at a location on Ranola Road. It has worked out well. So we're rec now that was a much smaller sign. It was ground mount sign, uh, but we have used this provision in the past. Uh, because this is taller, we're bringing it to council for your approval and asking and recommending that you do so. And I know that we have representation for Innovation Quarter here today. If there are any questions, uh, could Mr. Pleasance come forward? Are you going to come? Let me. Right. Of course, we know you, but if, for the record, if you'll give us your name and address. Good afternoon. Graydon Pleasance, 1800 Greenbrier Road. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just, just a couple of things. Is this, uh, is this a, uh, a renovation of an existing piece of metal tower that has been repurposed? Or Correct. It, when so this, see, I look at this basically as one is a preservation effort to reuse and preserve an uh, industrial element that is now in storage as part of your project, which is brilliant. And then the second thing, it really is public art as well. I think you've done a brilliant job of taking this and, and adaptively reusing it, and it become an iconic part of your landscape. And I want to really commend you for that, for taking the effort to, one, save it in the first place, and then find an appropriate use and, and placement for it. So I'm all for this. this is Thanks. Appreciate the kind words and support. Any other questions, comments? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, and when that comes up, we can get a vote on that, please. And that's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Item G3. Item G3, Hobby Park Master Plan Presentation. And I believe the presentation here will be Mr. Royston. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, members of the committee. Let me uh, get this set up uh, on the screen for you. Give me one second. Oh, so use the touch screen. I had another uh, separate slide that I wanted to kind of go through and make, um, as I went through the presentation, do some highlights. But what I will um, do is kind of go over those uh, zoomed in portions of the master plan project once I go through the kind of the overall uh, concept and, and how we got here. Um, Hobby Park is a 93.53 acre park that is located um, at 2301 West Clintonville Road. Um, currently, the existing conditions at the park uh, consist of mountain bike trails, uh, there's a remote control aircraft area, there's a soapbox derby track, there's a picnic shelter with restrooms, and there's also paved and unpaved parking. <clears throat> um, uh, we hired Jordan Consultants uh, to, to develop a master plan for the park. Um, some of the issues that we knew uh, going into the park when going through the site analysis um, was to focus on upgrading the existing conditions of the park. We found that uh, a lot of the users and some a lot of the functions there at Hobby Park uh, worked well, uh, very similarly how we approached uh, the master plan for Washington Park. The park itself functions well. Um, it really needs some makeup. Uh, really need to go in and make some improvements, um, in general improvements along the walking trails, uh, parking, lighting. Um, some of the other issues uh, included the poor entryway in and out of Hobby Park. Um, uh, those of you that have ever visited that park know that it's a steep incline um, to enter the area. Um, and the, there's some uh, concerns with visibility as well. Um, uh, parking was an issue, signage, lighting, um, actually locating the mountain bike trails. Uh, there were several um, different types of mountain bike trails there at the park. We had those mapped, um, uh, we, so we knew exactly where those trails were located. Uh, drainage, um, fencing, um, and also looking at examining the health of the three ponds that were on the site. We want to make sure that those ponds were as healthy as possible for uh, for the ecosystems that they, that they support. <clears throat> um, during our master plan process, we also met with several stakeholders, including the RC Aircraft Control Club. Um, as part of the 2014 geo bomb referendum, we were able to renovate the existing, well, excuse me, the previous uh, shelter that the RC Club used. Um, that shelter, I want to zoom in on an area so that you can see the, where that uh, shelter was, uh, the new shelter is, and 
that has since been replaced uh, here right at P is the location of the new aircraft uh, of the new shelter that is used by the um, aircraft hobbyists um, it was a shelter that was designed to kind of look um, have the look and feel of an aircraft hangar uh, due to the, the user type that uh, frequents um, this area, we added accessible parking. Uh, we, um, in meeting with the RC control group, we found that there were some issues from them parking at the main parking area and then traversing all the way to the, to the shelter. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we made things as comfortable uh, as possible for, for those users, um, users as well. Um, we also met with, um, had several meetings with FORBA. Uh, FORBA is the Forsyth Off-Road Bicycle Association. Uh, we actually have an upcoming uh, scheduled meeting this Thursday uh, to kind of go over some ideas uh, with them on how we can partner together to make some improvements on the mountain bike trails. And we also, uh, as part of our consulting team, we have a very renowned landscape architect that does a lot of hands-on work with a lot of um, local bike clubs. His name is Tony McGee, um, and we're looking to bring him on, on board to work with us in forward to see if we can get some, um, uh, some volunteers to kind of come out and help us make some improvements on those trails. Uh, throughout the throughout the park some of the park improvements um, as part of the overall master plan and as part of the overall master plan included <clears throat> creating uh, mountain bike and walking trail standards with varying difficulties um, down at the bottom of your map there's a legend that kind of goes over the different um, uh, levels of difficulty with the uh, mountain bike trails um, as when we inventoried the existing trails on the park, we found that several of the trails actually uh, went off of our property and then came back onto our property. Um, our consultant did a very good job at reworking the, where those trails would, uh, how those trails tie back, tie back together and kept them on our property. Um, there will be four varying difficulties that are being proposed for walking trails with the easiest. Uh, there are about 1.3 miles of the easiest types of walking trails with no obstacles, uh, grades that are 5 to 10%. Uh, in terms of uh, their slope, hardened surfaces, three to five foot uh, widths, and, um, but they'll, they'll be built for walkers and mountain bike. And then you have the more difficult trails, which are 1.46 miles. Um, a little bit more difficult trails on here, they're labeled as very difficult. They're about 1.73 miles, and then the extremely difficult trails um, are 0.85 miles. And one of the things I would like to point out that we have the, the grade changes throughout Hobby Park are pretty severe. Um, and even given without some sort of structured or standardized trail width, trail width, mountain bikers typically are flying up and down these trails and they're very, very narrow, but it's something that they enjoy. Well, we think that it was very, very, we thought that would be very important to make sure that those trail widths were standardized and there was some sort of standard that was developed so that they can be maintained. Uh, we can provide the, that information to them so that they can help us maintain those trails but there, uh, there was a need and a request to have a uh, varying difficulties of trail widths for people to use for whether you're walking or ride, riding mountain bikes. Um, we also looked at improving the, let me get zoomed back out here. We, look, we also looked at improving the um, entrance um, into, into Hobby Park, which is located here. Uh, we felt that the, um, there, there would be a need to add a turning lane, um, spec, uh, spoke with uh, a very intelligent individual uh, about how this could possibly work and, w and it may involve actually widening the road on the southern end of the road and using the existing lane that's coming into Hobby Park and making that the actual turn lane. Given the grade change and the slope um, entering and ex exiting the facility, that may be one of the ways that we would look at engineering that and making that happen. But we'll work with our uh, DOT department as well as our uh, state to make that, uh, to make those improvements. Um, Another uh, improvement that was suggested as part of the overall master plan was a new entry um, and focal point for, for the park, which is, uh, which is shown here. Uh, there really wasn't an area once you entered the park that kind of uh, informed the users that, you, that you're here at Hobby Park with, with appropriate signage, with has rules, um, some sort of iconic structure, whether like a, a picnic shelter or a gazebo. Um, and so we looked to, we looked to add um, uh, that staging area, if um, so to speak, to that it also included bike repair stations and other tools that and, and other supplies that could be used by the soapbox derby users or by anybody out there using mountain bike trails. Um, so it would have the uh, park entry, uh, their bike repair station. Um, we also looked at um, 
renovating the existing lower parking lot the, that is existing there on the site. Um, there's some very uh, uh, several different types of issues with the existing parking lot and that one of the uh, through meeting with several of the user groups looked at and one of the requests that we received from them was looking at um, form, more uh, creating a more formalized parking area for people to use uh, appropriate signage doing some lighting adding curb and gutter so we can control the runoff and get it um, get the water um, into subsurface drainage systems um, as part of that process we also looked at this uh, this area here which is labeled J uh, which is the uh, which was the site of the former remote control car track. <clears throat> we worked with the group several years ago to make some improvements on um, for that particular remote control car track. That group um, has since um, disbanded. Uh, we do we do know that there's a need, and we did speak to some individuals uh, who wanted to um, come back and help us re uh, kind of create that program again. So we did um, designate an area here at Hobby Park to re to recreate that. Um, we also looked at. Um, expanding uh, the existing soapbox derby uh, staging area shown located D here on your map uh, that will um, we will repave the area uh, expand it slightly so that um, when the soapbox derby was not um, in in use that that area could be used for uh, additional parking for the site it could also be used for if you wanted to create uh, if you wanted to go to the new what we um, term deemed as Hobby Falls. Uh, there's actually a, uh, there are two ponds there that we're, we're looking at doing some improvements on, um, cleaning them up, uh, creating an intimate um, picnic area for uh, more of a, a typical park-like experience. But there's actually a pretty, uh, pretty nice waterfall that is located between those two ponds. And we're looking at going there and cleaning that area up and making it more accessible for people for picnicking and, and uh, other casual and private um, picnicking opportunities there at Hobby Park. And so the parking area at D, when it's not used for soapbox derby, could be used as a parking area so that you wouldn't have to walk such a distance to get to um, the new picnic areas around the ponds. Now, we wanted to create a family-oriented picnic area there, so we would add several picnic tables, uh, clean that area up, and really create a, a healthy ecosystem for users to enjoy and for the plants and animals to thrive in there at Hobby Park. Um, that would um, uh, involve, uh, excuse me, uh, involve, as I mentioned, dredging the ponds, uh, I know there's a tremendous amount of sediment that has developed over there over the years. Um, there are uh, healthy fish there. Uh, people do fish in those ponds. Uh, and if we're inviting people to those areas, we want to make sure that they're as healthy and as safe as possible for people to use. Um, that is the overall uh, 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 view and idea for creating this new natural picnic area there at the falls. Um, we think there was a, a, health, a nice addition, and we received uh, several comments from meeting with and talking with people from the public about creating that, that more intimate area. Um, uh, one of the two other things that were mentioned as part of the overall um, master plan process that we received from the RC uh, Aircraft Control Club was that they were also they requested a, uh, an alternate softer surface to be able to land their aircraft on. Um, I've been out there and have seen uh, aircraft from F-16s, um, uh, biplanes. I've seen uh, some really, really large jets and they wanted a smaller area or softer area that they could land their aircraft on. They said that sometimes when they land you know, just on the pavement, it damages their, their, their models. And so we've added a natural, <clears throat> it can either be a grass or an artificial turf uh, additional landing strip um, for those airplanes. And these circular areas are also airplanes. They're uh, line, they're attached to a cable and the planes um, travel in circles. And they also requested an artificial turf or grass or natural softer landing area for them. So we recreated that as well think that we've um, gone through and created a very, very nice, healthy update for Hobby Park. I think we're working with the mountain bike clubs and the walking clubs so that we can get some, uh, some volunteer hours and some, some elbow grease out there that can help us build and maintain and develop a standard for the trails um, and feel that we would uh, have accomplished in kind of bringing that life back to Hobby Park. Uh, we will continue to have discussions with the Soapbox Derby Club um, after the improvements are made to try to get them to come back and begin to host their tournaments. Uh, in the meantime, in, uh, in 2017, as well as upcoming this year, uh, we host uh, Hobby Park is the location that is selected for um, a, a large slalom event. It's actually a nationally recognized slalom event, um, and we've, uh, we've attracted them uh, to bring some um, new life out there. We're also working with uh, programs with RC uh, Control Club 
to, to bring some younger, younger people in to get them interested in the hobby. Uh, it, it's really, really fascinating once you get to see them operate their aircraft. We're working with them to, addi to add additional outdoor programming there at Hobby Park as well. At this point, I'll answer any questions. <coughs> Slalom, you talking about skateboards? Yes. Skateboards on the um, soapbox derby yes. hill. Pretty exciting. And is that um, that's a, a statewide national competition? What it's a it's a national competition that's organized by a group in California. And does that occur every year then? Um, this will be the second year in a row. Um, they're very pleased right. with the service that they were receiving at Hobby Park. Um, they actually have. Um, pictures of Hobby Park on their website, and so it's yeah. actually a part of their web, Hobby Park is actually part of their web design, so we, we believe it's a partnership that we can foster and continue to develop. So, so I think this is a good example of very specific uh, constituencies that target this park. It's not really a neighborhood park, is it? it? It's a community park that draws very specialized airplane flyers, soapbox derby people, car drivers, cross country bike riders, uh, coming in and using a very large park, actually. Do we have the ability at this park, for example, to uh, provide Boy Scout camping or something like that? Would that be an option? For uh, there are areas there at Hobby Park where we could work with uh, local Boy Scouts. Different Scout groups. Of both, yeah, we have restrooms. We have woodland areas. Right. That do that. Um, I think, you know, it reflects with a very complex topography. Uh, I know the water's a problem. I know access has been a problem there, based just getting up into the park has been a problem, and I'm glad that you're addressing that. Uh, I've spent some time out there with the airplane, model airplane people, uh, very enthusiastic, uh, unique. We now see a lot of drone flyers, apparently, out there. I've noticed in the last time coming out, so I think we've got a whole new clientele. Uh, cars less so, maybe, but a lot of drones and, and airplanes. Uh, I'm excited that Soapbox Derby may be a possibility to continue that. That's a unique track and something I think the city could benefit from. Uh, I am also appreciative that we are going to more formalize uh, the bike and walking paths, uh, which have been, a lot of them I think have just been made uh, through time, and to standardize them in a way that, not, first of all, on our property and not wandering off into the neighbor's property, and second of all, that they are safe and reliable, uh, maintained to be on, I think is incredibly important. I appreciate your effort to provide a variety of uh, difficulties and recognize those and map those out so the people know what they're getting into before they enter the, enter the park. So it's clearly a very diversified landscape. It has a variety of offerings uh, for both active and, and passive sort of participation. And I think it's a great asset for the city, and I appreciate your work on it. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, just a couple of technical ones. Uh, the white line to the topo lines are ten foot drop between them. Everybody? Yes, those are. I believe those are in ten foot okay. intervals. Um, and then this on the section where the um, shelter was that you were talking about. That part of the trail or the roadway there is white versus gray. Is that a difference in treatment or? It, it will be. Uh, it would be a different. It would be a different treatment, and the road is um, is is much more narrow at that point because we do. Uh, if we're inviting vehicles down to the uh, enlarged uh, staging area for the soapbox service, so they can have access to the ponds, we want to make sure that we limit the the how fast vehicles are traveling down okay. to that area. Okay. And then, uh, have has there been a public? There have been public input sessions on the on the plan. I mean, have the cycling community been able to take a look at this and see? We brought in. Uh, we had several stakeholder meetings. Um, it, it wasn't the Hobby Park wasn't like a traditional park that's surrounded by neighborhoods. You have people from all over Winston that, that frequent the area. What we did was had several meetings with a lot of the stakeholders, the RC uh, remote control aircraft clubs, the uh, remote control car clubs. We talked to uh, the slalom group. That's how we were able to get them out there. We've, been, we've had meetings with uh, uh, the Soapbox Derby group. Uh, we've had meetings with fishermen uh, and just uh, trail walkers, trail users, mountain bike groups, um, and there are uh, just a lot of different groups. And the, the difficulty is that you, there are so many different, it's hard to get the mountain bike group to sit down and actually have a very good conversation with you because they'd like to kind of be left alone. But they were actually pretty forthcoming and wanting, uh, once they understood that we were trying to come in there and make some improvements. Uh, didn't want to kind of undo all the hard work that they've in the old groups that they've used to kind of make those trails what they are, but just kind of want to work with them and actually solicited their help 
uh, to see if they would be interested in providing some help to the city to help us maintain it. So there were, we talked to all the stakeholders um, and not necessarily neighborhood groups as part of the public input for this project. That, that was my concern. Thank you. The <clears throat> only question I had really was uh, more of a side point. Uh, you mentioned dredging the ponds. Is yeah. there a dam safety issue or is there some other reason? No, it's just that, that over the years, and we think the ponds, they're, a lot of the, because of the runoff that's happened there when that's kind of been uncontrolled, uh, there's a lot of sediment that's uh, developed in those ponds. Uh, it's the, the pond that's on t further, further west, is, uh, there's a tremendous amount of sediment in there, and we wouldn't want that sediment to um, create an unhealthy pond for fish, uh, frogs, or crayfish, and other wildlife in there. But I'd, I'd encourage you to consult with some, um, uh, some habitat experts on that, because mm -hmm. that's a, a, a natural part of progression of a, of a pond in the, in the wild. Right. Uh, it uh, develops into more of a wetland area and it's an enormously useful habitat. Right. Um, so um, I, I, would, I would have those consultations before you. I made a final decision on, on the, uh, the question of dredging out the sediment. Yes. Um, but uh, you know, that's why I asked if there was a safety issue with the dam first. Cause I, no, it's, there wasn't a safety issue. It's, um, over the years, I mean, the people, we've pulled tires. Um, and other debris, um, a lot of uh, oh. people have dumped things in there. We've pulled things out, and it's just, it was one of the things through the site analysis that our consultant looked at. All right. Um, thank you. Anything else? Well, I would just say, Mr. Royston, I appreciate the presentation. Um, I'm very pleased with the catalog or the repertoire that the Parks and Recs Department has. I think that, you know, regardless of what you might want to go fishing at Salem Lake, or you might want to go spend some time of peace and tranquility at the quarry, or you might want to go participate in several hobbies or some conglomerate of activities at, at Hobby Park. So I, I'm just very pleased with the way this city is moving. I thank you for your leadership and the presentation. I certainly think we're moving in the right direction. Thank you, and, thank you and sir. This, you know, stands to become, <clears throat> with this kind of improvement, a real destination for our, our area, uh, in particular, I think, with uh, the, um, uh, the mountain biking. Um, but also, you know, the other hobbies. You know, I, I realize I've never asked this question. The name Hobby Park, does that come from the hobbies, or is that uh, actually somebody's name? Just say yes. It, uh, I actually did some research on that today, and it actually comes from the hobbies that people um, have, have wanted to use there. Okay, so it is actually a park for the hobbies, yes? Park for the hobbyists, yes. Sir. Genius. Genius. Imagine that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Worcester. Mm -hmm. All right, that was an information item, um, and we have one more information item. That's uh, recycling commodities, uh, and I believe, in addition, to Mr. Turner, Mr. Taylor is going to present. It. Mr. Taylor, the director of the GSD department, is with us today. Good evening. Mr. Chairman and other members of the committee. Good evening. At the request of Councilmember Clark, there were questions raised about the recycling commodity values. And I will tell you that there are some challenges right now with commodity values. The market uh, was somewhat heading downward. And now we're faced with a national policy uh, that's actually being implemented by China which is driving down the actual cost of commodities. One benefit is uh, the contract that we currently have is uh, unique in the fact that while some municipalities are actually paying to get rid of their recyclables, uh, because the blended value has fallen below $80 per ton, the city of Winston-Salem is guaranteed a $10 flat rate. So for the next four years, um, some of the things that we'll need to do is continue to emphasize the cleanliness of the stream because the meals are very particular now about the commodities they're receiving. So we just have to continue our efforts to minimize contamination. So we are experiencing a decrease, but we also have somewhat of a cushion because of our service agreement. 
I had a question about the plastics. Um, I'm often challenged on why does the city not uh, take this plastic? Why are you so specific about what you'll uh, allow in? And I, um, yeah, I will generally try to explain the difference in uh, uh, plastic contents and uh, the degree to which they can be recycled and reused, uh, the fact that there's simply not a commodity market for everything we'd like to um, to reuse. Can you sort of give a little additional background on that? Sure. Uh, what they would consider to be the most marketable plastics are number ones and number twos. Number ones consist of things like water bottles, uh, things of that nature. Uh, number twos are uh, what would be considered high density polyethylene, which would consist of things like milk jugs. So what drives the market is the marketability of the commodity. So those particular items are recycled because there's a strong market for them and they bring the most value. Um, and others, the fours, the fives? Well, uh, our program accepts all of them. Um, but they just don't carry the same uh, value. There's some plastic items that we don't uh, accept, things like uh, PVC and rigid uh, plastics of that type, simply because there are no markets for it. And our current service agreement would require uh, our service provider to consider those items a residue, which in turn would end up being an additional cost for the city wants to say. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in addition, we occasionally have issues where citizens are asking us, well, why don't you take plastic toys or other types right. of plastic that aren't bottles, jugs, et cetera? And those basically become a problem for the processor. Uh, our MRF or materials processing facility that the contractor operates has the ability to manage and semi automatedly process certain materials, but some of the other materials that, would be, that we're asked to do to handle become a problem for that semi-automated process. And uh, so any, if, to anyone who's listening, don't put plastic bags in your recycling bin, please. It gums up the equipment. And, and don't put your pizza boxes in um, because the, uh, the residual grease in the pizza box makes it effectively unusable. Uh, no, no bags and no pizza boxes. People feel like they're being helpful by doing I, that. I know. I know. In reality, they're so, and, and, and don't don't bag your recyclables up and put the bag in, in the bin. It's a great idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the kind of thing that people are used to doing because it's uh, it's it's helpful and trash keeps trash and flying all it, everywhere, but it's it's um, it's counterproductive in a big way uh, in, in recycling. Other comments or questions on this? Right. Well, could I ask, Roy, I mean, in your commodities, as you discussed, I noticed you did not identify aluminum or metals as a commodity that um, obviously has always been talking about recycling beer cans. Okay. Uh, what, what is the market for that? And is that going to be a, continue to be a strong market? It, it is one of the commodities that we accept in our program, and it is actually strong at this time. So it has uh, not been impacted negatively by these things that have taken place over in China. So uh, for the foreseeable future, it appears to be uh, a good commodity for us. So as we, as we recycle and we send, it's, it's all mixed now. Everything can be mixed. So you're throwing in your aluminum, which is now, of course, tariffs from China and everywhere. Uh, it, it, you throw in all that material, and, and we get values by the cubic ton or whatever it is that we get paid for, which includes plastic, aluminum, paper, and everything, I assume, right? Is that? Well, we, we currently have a single stream system, as you mentioned, and so all the commodities are placed in the same container, but at the MRF, which is the Material Re Recovery Facility, those materials are sorted out, right. and so they're bailed depending upon the type of material, and then they're sent to market. And yes, so sir. The, the waste management company gets so much money for plastic and metals and all the different materials that are sorted. And according to this chart, it's obvious that glass is actually a liability at this point. It would indicate that recycling glass is not profitable uh, within the recycle industry at this point in time. 
That is correct, sir. Yeah. Glass is, is uh, So I remember the problem. time when we used to have deposits on all of our little Coke bottles and beer bottles. Each of them was worth five cents. We could walk down the uh, streets and we'd pick them up as kids and we'd take them and, and cash them in. Now, apparently, there's no deposits required on any of these bottles, as I recall. And that would be a legislative act by the state, I suppose, to impose a recycle to address the issue of the cost of recycling glass. But that's that's a whole separate discussion, I suppose, at some point to be made. I, I think it's important that we look for ways to reuse this material. And uh, or so if, if we have an empty bottle and it can be refilled, we should look at ways to do that. And if that's what the state needs to do, I would encourage whoever's listening to advocate that. Uh, in the case of metals, which has always been a, a primary product, um, clearly uh, we're going to continue to have a strong market there. My question sort of is, is the strong market of aluminum going to be able to cover the diminishing value of paper and other products as far as our supplier goes, as we go to waste management, whoever, and if we continue to provide them a lot of aluminum, which they love, uh, is that going to be able to sustain our recycle program financially? Uh, in the long term, or are we going to see, well, we're only going to take aluminum in the next five years down the road? Do you have any forecast on that? I, I think the suggestion has been made by a lot of the industry experts to ride out the difficult times and not to make a lot of uh, major changes to the program. Uh, we've experienced uh, several downturns in the past uh, 15 to 20 years. There was one in the 90s. There was one during the time of the uh, latest recession. And so what we believe is because OCC, which corrugated cardboard, has still uh, maintained some value, mm -hmm. that eventually uh, we will see the markets return again. Okay. Write it out. Right. And there's some non-economic sort of sidebar to this as well. People want to recycle. Absolutely. So if, even if it's a zero sum, I think if we poll the public, they're going to say it's worth spending a little bit more in tax dollars so that we don't put this in the landfill. So it's not a completely economic equation. You know, there, there's a value in not putting this stuff and filling up our landfills. No question about it. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Taylor, a guarantee, as we know, is only good as the person or the entity that gives it. Uh, you mentioned that we are guaranteed a $10 flat rate, and I'm assuming that's per ton. Who is making the guarantee in this case, and can we count on the fact that the guarantee will, will stay in place? Uh, yes, sir. We have a service agreement with waste management. Uh, we signed a 10-year deal in 2012, and so until the service agreement reaches its end, they are obligated to provide us the, the flat rate. In the event that their, their cost goes up, that means nothing to us. They'll it, it, eat the, the cost. Absolutely, and uh, as a matter of fact, the actual blended value has been below 80 for some time, and they have fulfilled their financial obligation. Thank you. Thank you. No question. Anything that we should be ready to uh, uh, react to coming up in the foreseeable near term? Uh, I would say that the thing that we all need to do as a community is just continue to emphasize uh, not contaminating our stream. And so we're, we're working on several things to try to uh, give a little bit more attention uh, to what we already have uh, put forward. So education, awareness of the need to keep the uh, stream clean is going to be our best strategy to weather this storm. So put those bottles and cans and papers in the recycling bin. Don't put the plastic bags or the pizza boxes or the trash. That is correct. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Thank Taylor. You, thank you. I always appreciate the outstanding work you did. Thank you. Um, Second. You know, I don't see any other items on the agenda. Mr. Sure, how many years have you been working for the city now? 35. 35 years. And how many years have you been the lead staff person at this public works committee? 15. Roughly. 1560. Uh, I, I thought basically it's been doggone near as long as I've been on on the council. Um, you know, it, tra traditionally I I ask you a question at the close of, of every 
<laughs> every meeting. And I know the answer, too. Is there, uh, <laughs> is there anything else that you have for the committee today? No. <laughs> well, there is one more item. I think there's just appreciation. One, one, all one, one <laughs> If I say something, will you sit down? <laughs> speech, 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 speech. <laughs> Uh, well, I have appreciated the opportunity to work for the committee and also all your support throughout the years. And as we've made requests and proposals to you, the committee has always been receptive to what we had to say, regardless of whether you liked it or not. You've always been receptive to hearing it. And as staff, we couldn't ask for anything more. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen? Adjourn. Move, move adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Turner.